Oh, good morning. Good evening. Good late afternoon, late night, depending on where you are in the world. Today, we're going to talk about five things that you didn't know about fructose. Maybe you know it, but I'm not sure that we did. Uh, fructose is very surprising. You know, one of the things we were talking about before we started, uh, I was asking folks to guess what the glycemic index of fructose is. Remind me a little bit later and I'll, and we'll talk about what it was, but we'll not, we won't talk about it just yet. Speaking of glycemic index and maybe even a surprising glycemic index, uh, we'll also talk about Ezekiel bread and what's the, the glycemic index for that. I used to roll my eyes when people would bring up Ezekiel bread because my point, there's, it's sprouted bread because my point was, you know, bread is bread. Uh, people, people talk about, well, uh, whole wheat products are fine. That's what you want to eat. Well, uh, white bread has a glycemic index of 75. Whole wheat bread has a, a glycemic index of 65. And table sugar has a glycemic index of 50. So they say eat whole 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 grain products? Mm, no. Be very careful. So anyhow, those are some of the topics that we're going to be talking about today. We're going to shorten, we're going to start shortening our intro. Uh, most, uh, most folks that have seen the channel know a little bit more about our content. We want to get quicker into the content. Um, if you haven't seen our content before, if you're new, uh, we cover things that are going to kill you or disable you much more than anything else. And that's the purpose, helping you understand those things that can kill and disable us so we can avoid that and live a healthy life. We've got Jeannie joining us again today. Um, Jeannie is our nurse practitioner. She's joined us a few months ago and she's been doing great. She's starting to see more and more patients with us and um, getting rave reviews, both from our staff, from Jesus and Miranda, and from our patients. So thank you for joining us, Jeannie. Thank you, Dr. Brewer. And of course, we have Jesus with us again today uh, to keep me uh, on track. And <clears throat> I'll, I'll do my best. I can't promise anything. <laughs> and, and I'm having some sly Wi-Fi connection, so uh, don't be surprised if I froze for us for for a moment. Well, that's likely to give me some uh, the upper hand and a little bit more of an advantage if your uh, Wi-Fi is sticking. I'll be able to jump in there and maybe uh, click on some questions to answer that you wouldn't have let me answer before. Just for today. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, again, back to previous topics. Recently, we covered high triglycerides and plaque reversal. Plaque reversal is a big topic for us. People think that you cannot reverse cardiovascular plaque. Not true. Now, it's the question is, is it a practical goal? Here's the practical goal. You can stabilize cardiovascular plaque. You can take your risk off the table. And that is what this channel is all about. Okay, let's uh, move on to the next thing. I'll cover some items real quick. Uh, yes, we're uh, accepting Medicare. We started that a few months ago. That program is up and active. Um, yes, we see patients. Give us a call if you'd like to, uh, to come in and be seen by us as a patient. Hey, Sus, why don't you get us started on my big surprise about Ezekiel bread, because I used to, these people used to, again, they used to tell me, have you tried, they would ask, have you tried Ezekiel bread? It's really good. I'd roll my eyes and say, it's bread. It's a grain product. I wasn't so well informed, was I? Yes. And, and I, I was kind of the same category. I, I believe this is the first time I heard, heard uh, hear about Ezekiel bread. Uh, I, I haven't seen that in a lot of places, at least in Mexico. But here are four things that we found about the Ezekiel bread, uh, evidence-based, that are really interesting. So first thing, Ezekiel bread cereals, also known as sprouted grains, are dried single-seeded fruits 
long-term grains that go through a germination process. And you were discussing with us a little bit about that germination process, and I like the way you explained it, Dr. Brewer. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll let you explain us a little bit more about that, if, if, you, if you don't mind. Sure. So uh, as, you, as you look at the marketing uh, background for Ezekiel bread, it's, um, Jeannie, if you could look it up, it's, a, it, it's a, out of the book of the Bible, Ezekiel like 4 or 9 or something, and if you can read it. Basically, what they're talking about is different ingredients. It, I don't think it's quite so much in uh, the ingredients. Let me know. Go ahead and interrupt me when you get it. The, um, I got it here. Okay, go yeah, ahead and Eze read that. Okay, Ezekiel 4.9. Take wheat and barley, beans and lentils, millet and spelt, put them in a storage jar, and use them to make bread for yourself. You are to eat it during the 390 days you lie on your side. So uh, for those of you who don't recognize that, that comes from the Judeo-Christian Bible, the Old Testament. And uh, they were really more talking about um, the ingredients. I'm not so sure how much of, I don't know how much of the secret behind Ezekiel bread has to do with the ingredients. What we're going to talk about and what, uh, what Jesus is referring to is the sprouting process. And if you look at this article, we, I, I found that a couple of weeks ago when I was looking this up, when I had my surprise about the, um, the glycemic index for Ezekiel bread. It's basically looking at sprouted grains. And here's what happens. You allow, you allow the seeds, the grains are seeds. You allow them to germinate. You allow them to start sprouting. And here's what happens. The, car the stored carbohydrates start uh, being used as energy to form cell walls. They start becoming components of cell walls in the leaves and the, uh, the stems of the sprout. So when you think about it and you read this article, it becomes really clear. What's happening is the stored carbs in the seeds are actually turning into a salad. So uh, you're getting a much better um, list of macronutrients. Jesus, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah. And there, there are different types of uh, sugars to say on this process, and they end up uh, promoting more kind of a sucrose base, which is really low, low glycemic index and just not too much about, uh, amount of it. So that, that takes us to the point number two. Ezekiel bread has a lower glycemic index, which is around, uh, which is around, you mentioned 35, 35. I believe. The glycemic index for Ezekiel bread, this, these sprouted breads is 35. And that's in comparison to, um, you, you remember this, the glycemic index for white bread and, and quote, whole wheat bread? Yeah, uh, it's, it's about 45 or near 50 something, right? 70. Yeah. 70. Exactly right. 70. 75 for white bread. That's and so you say, whoa, just to, 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 as a reminder, Jesus mentioned sucrose a minute ago. Basic table sugar has a glycemic index of 50. And you would assume that's really bad. Again, white bread, 75. And so everybody, it, you see it all over the internet. How many times have you seen eat whole grain products? Those are healthy. What's the glycemic index for whole wheat bread? It was like five, five less than white bread, right? Yeah. Like it's 65, 70. Yeah. 65, mm -hmm. 70. Look it up. And it's just amazing. And so what they're saying, what, what, what you'll, the interpretation that you'll see is, oh, well, this is whole wheat bread. So this is good for me. It's got a high, it, it wrecks your blood sugar more than, um, more than table sugar. You, you, you might as well get a spoonful of sugar out of the, out of the table sugar crock. Uh, so uh, again, one of the major uh, misinterpretations, misunderstanding about diets 
that's leading us to a society where we think, well, you know what, you get into your 60s, you don't know, you can't predict it, you could have a heart attack or a stroke and die. And that's just life. Well, of course, that's just life when you, you know, when you got these kind of misunderstandings as part of your culture. Just, just like a comment on, on that side, I just had a patient telling me yesterday that uh, that that one of uh, his other physicians told him that the human is programmed to last until 80 years only. Wow. <laughs> and I was like, no surprise with this type of uh, uh, diet and exercise uh, culture. But anyway, so the doctor I'm saying thinking, to the patient, expect yeah. to make it, hopefully you'll make it to your 80s. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, well, that's interesting. Actuarials these days, when they're looking at your uh, um, your retirement accounts, they plan once you make it to 60, their plan is that you're going to make it till 90. So doctors need to we need to re reconfigure our expectations. Definitely. Now, going back to the sea children, low glycemic index around 50 grams of carbs per slice, but it's actually 12 grams of net carbs um, with a lot of protein, fiber, antioxidant compounds, phenolic acids, flavonoids, and polyphenols. Well, it's, it's part of that uh, sprouting and germination process that we just talked about. And uh, you have a lot of those white bread Uh, on their marketing strategy saying that they are enriched with vitamins and minerals and all that stuff. And this is something that the, 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 the bread itself has just by the process it is, it's created. So speaking of net carbs, any comments, explanation for the, for the um, viewers on that? Uh, we're, we're talking about net carbs when we mention that we're uh, considering not fiber on yeah. that process. So three grams are basically fiber. That's why we don't count them. The other, the other grams are the ones that go into the system. So you'll see that a lot on the, the food labels as required by the FDA. Technically, fiber is a carb. And so the FDA, I think that's another FDA mistake. I think they uh, should not say... Uh, to list fiber as a carb. They got too many biochemists in their, in their groups, I think. So when you see things like hummus, tahini, um, salads, you know, they list very, very high carbs. And people think, oh my gosh, so I'm trying to watch my carbs, so I really don't want to eat salads, right? <laughs> no, that's not the correct interpretation. So um, what we're talking about with Ezekiel bread is that it's got 15 grams of carbs per slice, but three of those are fiber. So you subtract that out. Uh, I get a lot of questions from patients. Do you, is, that a, is that a bogus concept or is it real? And it's very, very real. You do not want to count fiber carbs as carbs in your diet. When we talk about eating 100 uh, grams of carbs per day, you can eat all of the fiber you want. So for example, you can eat all of the cauliflower, all of the um, Brussels sprouts, all of the asparagus, all of those things, because they're going to be mostly um, uh, fiber. Well, and um, I was Dr. Burr, we were talking earlier, and I have um, been seeing a patient who has, um, you know, is really trying to control her blood sugar. She's doing everything she can, and she watches um, her continuous monitor. She marks down every every meal, her fasting blood sugar, and then her one hour and her two hour and what she eats. And she's very specific, and she's finally gotten it where if she eats fiber first, then protein, then the carb, her, um, her, she doesn't have as many spikes in her blood sugar. Um, and I think that that that's really interesting. Now she's, she's kind of taking it down to a micro level on her own in her own with her own body's response. And she likes to, to have honey and she has a big response with honey. And so 
she has honey in her tea. And so she, that's why she was really trying to um, work with the way she ate and, and what, you know, what she ate first, second, and third. The other thing I was going to say is um, when you look up glycemic index and you pull up a chart on it versus net carbs, it can get confusing for people because honestly, at times it gets confusing for me if I don't keep my mind right. And I talked to Dr. Burr about this earlier. Um, and it's basically the reason the glycemic index matters is because of the spikes in blood sugar. So that's why when we're looking at that, that, you know, the things that have higher glycemic index are going to have more of a response. So. so a couple of questions. Number one, why are you worried about spikes in blood sugar? Because that, that has to do with insulin resistance. And it, it's spikes in blood sugar tend to, um, to cause inflammation. Uh, if you, if you boil it down, you start looking at the, the intima lining of the artery wall. The intima has uh, sort of a fuzzy um, grass like exper uh, appearance. And those little grass fiber, those are glycoproteins, those little fibers that stick uh, from the, the lining into the blood, uh, the flowing blood. And when you get a lot of glucose, uh, and it appears to be 140 or more for hour after hour, it starts to dissolve and or cut down those uh, glycoprotein fibers. So that's why we don't want to have blood sugar spikes over 40. And I mean, if it goes up and then comes immediately back down, that's far safer than a blood sugar spike that goes up and just stays up. Uh, and when you leave that to whatever you're eating and you don't know how your insulin is responding to that, you can have uh, what we call the loss of the first phase when the insulin is not responding adequately, uh, adequately mm -hmm. and it's letting that spike to prolong for a couple of hours. Right. Or, or you have this scenario where you have a really high spike, uh, spike of insulin as well. And it may or may not control that glucose spike on, on that process, but that doesn't last forever. Now, a lot of our viewers are not going to understand the term loss of first phase. Can you explain that? Yeah. So on, on a show a couple of weeks back, we covered the book from um, uh, the, diabetes, the diabetes epidemic and you from Dr. Joseph oh, Kraft. Joseph Kraft. And... Um, we describe the phases in which insulin responds to glucose. And one of the first phases is uh, whenever you have a spike on glucose, you will have a spike on insulin right after it, mm -hmm. just to try to control it. And then the usual process in insulin resistance is that you're going to have a high level of insulin as a response of a high level of glucose. But as you go through the years with high levels of glucose and frequent spikes of glucose, your pancreas is going to end up producing or the storage is going to run out of, out of it and the insulin is going to have to take more time on producing more insulin and it's going to take longer and that first phase the first response you're going to get into a point where you're going to lose that and if you lose that first phase response of insulin that means that whenever you have a spike on glucose that's going to last for longer and it's going to damage your vessels for more time so it's loss of first phase. So here's what happens. The, the pancreas actually stores insulin. Not only does it make insulin, it stores it. And uh, when you have a healthy insulin response, um, you get an immediate release of that insulin. But here's what happens. You start getting insulin resistant. So instead of having a fasting or basal insulin level of five or less, it goes up to six, eight, 10, 20. And if, you're in, if your pancreas is having to keep your blood sugar at levels 10, 15, 20, rather than five or less, it's not getting the opportunity to store that insulin. So then it loses that first phase response. We see that all the time. And Jesus, what we should do is um, get a couple of examples. Obviously, um, hide the identity, but show what it means when we see a glucose tolerance test and the patient has lost their first phase. Absolutely. Well, going back to the 
uh, four things about Ezekiel bread. The number three, germination induces enzymes to split up carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins into basic compounds. And that's kind of the process that we were discussing. Uh, a lot of the complexity and amount of carbohydrates is actually getting used on this process. So the final product of these grains is very, very, very low carbohydrate because it's already been used as energy. So it's turning the seed, which is a carbohydrate storage component, into a salad. Basically. <laughs> and number four, Ezekiel bread might increase metabolism in general, improve immunity, and provide vitamins and minerals. So that's kind of the extra um, positive effect, which is very, very related to the amount of antioxidant compounds that it has on it and the protein that it has on it as well. Now, that comment alone sounds like an advertisement for Ezekiel bread, but that's not where you got that, right? No, no, it's it's from the very the, from the article, and we are saying Ezekiel bread just because it's easier to pronounce than sprouted grains. But <laughs> you know what we're talking about. You can buy the the, the branded one, of course. Yeah, especially it's always in the name. freezer. It's in the freezer section too. You have to know that little trick with it. It doesn't store very well, does it? It doesn't keep around the uh, the kitchen at room temperature like most breads. Well, that, that talks also about the process itself because it's treated more, treated more like a vegetable yeah. than it is treated as a bread that has a lot of conservatives on it. Yeah. And Jeannie had a comment really interesting that I didn't know about the process and how to eat it. So if you want to go yes, in you, it, it is, The best idea is to toast it. And I've not, I'm, I'm going to be honest, I tried it one time untoasted and I was not a fan. And Dr. Brewer and I were talking and he said that he um, has avocado toast in the morning now with it. He's a he's a believer yeah. in it now. And with his avocado toast, he always eats it toasted. So he's not tried it untoasted. I don't know that I'd recommend that. It um, I take it straight from freezer to toaster. <laughs> there you go. Anything else about sprouted breads? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I just leave the downside remark on there in case anybody has a comment on that um my, my understanding is bread in general something that you want to avoid but if you want to eat bread try to sprout it uh, sprouted bread maybe and it's going to impact your metabolism in a better way than white bread or whole grain bread as as with anything we'll get plenty of hater comments especially maybe from the um the uh carnivore community but you know what again you don't get on youtube unless you got thick skin um it, it is we have to we're going to have to change or modify our comments a little bit one of the things i'm always saying is stay away from breads pastas any grain products and as you start looking at sprouted grain it's not quite so much a grain product anymore it's something different one time we're going to have to talk about the chickpea pastas and see what those are yeah. about. Really good point. Chickpeas are in, what is it tahini or hummus? Huh, well, hummus, but tahini is also in hummus. You're our expert in, uh, in Mediterranean food, right? Yes, I am. So how, what, what is the glycemic index uh, for uh, chickpeas? We did this yesterday. Um, uh, let me look it up. I know this about it because it is, um, they both have a lot of fiber and tahini comes from sunflower seeds. Um, so, and then um, chickpeas are what, you know, are the beans that go in hummus, but the glycemic index of hummus, I can't remember it. Uh, well, it's what, 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 50. Yeah. And well, Jeannie, well, Jeannie confirms the information. Six. The glycemic six. index of hummus is six. Six. Wow. Yeah. So we're going to have a fellow named Chris Kenobi. He's an ophthalmologist. Uh, come on to the channel in a, what, August 4th, right? August the 2nd, I think, yes. And Chris does a, an, he's, a, he's a, been all about uh, 
macular gener uh, macular degeneration, uh, macular disease. He formed a a group called AMD uh, Cure AMD. It's uh, Cure Aging Age Related Macular Disease, and the vast majority of that is the, some of the aging processes that we're talking about. Diabetes as a core driver, just like diabetes is a core driver for cardiovascular disease, dementia, um, uh, kidney disease. He's got an interesting twist on the cause. He doesn't focus quite so much on carbs. He looks at what we call um, environmental epidemiology. Jesus, I know you've done a good bit of training in epidemiology. How would you describe environmental epidemiology? Now, we're not talking about the environment. What are we talking about? Whenever we, on environmental medicine, you have two, two perspectives. You have the planet and uh, healthy ecosystems and climate change and all that stuff. On the other side, you have the environment that surrounds the person, the patient. And it's very related to lifestyle, but lifestyle is more focused on what you do for your own body. Environmental has to do with what things are you exposed to and how you manage that. So you will see different impact on resources, food, pro food products available, and it has a, some stuff related to toxicology, depending on the soil where you live in, where the soil has to do with the vegetables and stuff that you eat. Uh, that's, that's what I have an understanding about it. Of course, it's going to be interesting to hear Dr. Kanabi. There's a, there's a slightly different definition of environment epidemi environmental epidemiology that I'm referring to. And that is when you look at <clears throat> what's going on in the larger environment, and assume that it's happening to the individual. So Chris Kenobi's uh, deck, and you've seen it, you've reviewed it. There is not, I don't think there is a single slide that looks at the individual. What he's looking at is the amount of carbs uh, uh, used per capita in the environment, the amount of omega-6 uh, being used per capita in the environment, but there's never a linkage between the individual exposure and the individual outcome. So that is the, uh, the major weak spot uh, that will go through. It will be a theme as he goes through that, but it's very, very interesting. And um, I tell you what, it made a believer out of me. I've been a good, much more of a skeptic about seed oils and some of those things until going over uh, Dr. Uh, Kenobi's information. So I'm looking forward to the show on the 4th. It's going to be really interesting. And you have a lot of people asking also, hey, have guests that that will challenge you on, on, on your perspectives and to have a debate or a discussion. And we do some of that since I, I'm in and Gene is here and we have different perspectives and brought and bring stuff different to the table. But having people that are doing some kind of prevention on other fields and Dr. Kenobi that is doing uh, a focus on glaucoma, it's going to be really interesting to, to see. It is. I would... I just need to correct myself because I think I said sunflower seeds for tahini and I meant sesame and its glycemic index is um, 40. Well, now, an interesting point. Um, um, sunflower seeds have a they're a high omega six uh, product, right? Mm -hmm. How about sesame seeds? I'm not sure. The reason I'm asking is that uh, Dr. Kenobi's work all begin all points towards omega-6 fats. So what he's saying is uh, our body was not built to eat as many omega-6 products as we're eating, at least crushed up to where our body can access that omega-6 oil. Um, well, you, I will tell you this. Sesame seeds have omega-6 21,372 poppy seeds of 28,000 pumpkin seeds of 8,000. So they're pretty high. It seems like an omega six. Hmm. Very interesting. 
So his his theory is that our body's not a was not built to be able to burn omega six oils. So when we bring them on, it takes our body a lot longer to to burn and get rid of that omega six oils. We've all known, and I, I've seen very little argument between the omega threes and omega sixes. So uh, again, join if you have an interest in this space and hearing Chris Kenobi uh, join us on the fourth. Uh, speaking of visitors, we got a, 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 an early agreement from Nina Tykoltz to join us. You remember, she's the uh, lady that wrote The Big Fat Surprise. And she's talking about saturated fats. Um, I know one of, the, one of the people on our team is a, is a vegan. So we'll have some interesting uh, opportunity for a debate there. We have to ask her to write down her questions. <laughs> yes. Okay. Anything else on uh, sprouted bread before we move into today's con uh, the long form content? I'm gonna have to edit the slide, right? I'm gonna take out the Ezekiel bread thing, <laughs> unless they unless they give us some uh, ro ro royalties or something. For they do. Something. They need to give us a royalty for that big advertisement you gave them today. <laughs> I don't. I don't even think that we have that on Mexico, and I'm ready. I'm re already advertising them. Now it's 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 more about the sprouted cereals than than the brand. But of course, uh, nothing sure, to add, Jenny. Oh, I'm sorry, Doctor Brody, cut you off. And I'm sure we'll get demonetized. Oh, oh, okay. So can I do? Can I say my thing anyway? Then go ahead. <laughs> no, avoid those. All I, I've been saying this for the last three weeks. Avoid avoid all those shakes from. Herbalife or similar companies, they are just loaded with sugar. Oh, yeah. If you see a shake and it's from one of these groups, uh, be afraid. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Jeannie, do, do, you do you have something to add? No, no, I'm good, Jesus. I was just kind of thinking in my head how many sesame seeds it takes to make a, a, a bottle of tahini. It must take millions. I would think so. Oh yeah. Uh, let, let's go to the to the main topic, Gilbert. If you give us the water ball, please. Five things you didn't know about. You were just getting ready to read the title. And the water ball came up. Five yeah, things you didn't know about fructose. We're used to that. We're used to that already. <laughs> um, so, if if I may, I'm gonna go over the slide, and we can just start the discussion. So, just a sure. brief introduction about fructose. Dr. Bruce sent me this article from Healthline from last year. So, fructose, also known as fruit sugar, is a type of sugar that is known as monosaccharide, which is a really, really simple type of sugar. I remember sugar is based on structures of carbon and hydrogen that are basically attached together and they form bigger chains. So monosaccharides are basically just one chain. It provides four calories per gram and is 1.2 to 1.8 times sweeter than table sugar. And there, are, there are a lot, there's a lot of discussion about the impact of fructose on cardiovascular health. And we have covered that as well in the past. Uh, you, you may, Dr. Bruder made a, has made a, a, um, a couple of reviews of the book Drop Acid from Dr. Perl Mother and the impact that fructose may have on uric acid and uh, therefore on cardiovascular disease. Uh, so there, there are discussions about that. Do you have anything to add before kind of a, an introduction to the five things that we're going to cover? Uh, no, just a comment. The, uh, I, I, I think Perlmutter ought to give us a royalty as well. Uh, it's a great book. Um, and if you haven't read it, if you haven't seen some of his videos on drop acid, I think it's very, very helpful. Basically, what he's talking about is the linkage between carb metabolism problems, insulin resistance, prediabetes, diabetes, and gout. It's people don't get that connection. I had a close family member uh, 
aging and you know we 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 tend to age into gout just like we age into um uh prediabetes diabetes and this person came in uh, with major pain uh, in her ankle and uh it turns out she was having another gouty attack and i started asking her what she'd been eating and Sure enough, she had been going crazy on some local peaches. And, and I brought up the classic, the classic old family practitioner, general practitioner story where you know, in the old days, we used to get uh, apples or oranges, especially oranges around Christmas time. You'd get a whole crate of them. That was the only time of the year you could get so many of them. And people would go crazy eating a lot of them. And guess what? you'd get a major gouty attack, a gout attack from it, the older folks that had gout. And here's why. That fructose that they were eating in the oranges has a five carbon ring, which is very, very similar to the purine ring, which uh, the body can't metabolize so well in terms of gout. It turns it into a, it's an acid. It turns it into a crystal and the crystals actually even deposit in plate cartilage, cartilage, places like your ear and cartilage down in your ankle and in your toe. And when you're, um, when those, the, the, it, it's physically like pins and needles being deposited in the cartilage of your joint. So if you imagine that microscopically and microscopically, you can take pictures, you can find pictures which show that. And you can understand where the pain from a gouty attack comes from. And sure enough, uh, my, my relative, as well as most other people, we had another, uh, a friend of hers last week came down with a gouty attack and she shared with him. She said, uh, are you eating peaches? He said, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. It's a very interesting, uh, point. It's basic, um, uh, basic medicine and uh, basic uh, chemistry, biochemistry. I, and I can tell we you. often only, go ahead. Sorry, hey, Zeus. Uh, go we ahead. all often think about gout and being with, you know, associated with red wines and rich cheeses and, and, you know, red meats, not necessarily peaches. So it's good information. I, I it think is. Dr. Dr. Perlmutter and Nina Tychos will get along very good. Yeah. And uh, to your point, Jeannie, it's, it used to be known as the, quote, rich man's disease. And they were talking about the seafood, the, all of these are sources of what we call purines. And purines uh, were the heavy DNA product. And they forgot the most common item, in which, which is not a purine. It's not a pyrimidine, but it's a fruit, fructose. Yeah. Just and, and another cultural thing, and, and I would love to hear some stories like this from Jeannie as well from the, Med the Mediterranean diet. On, on Mexico, we have the similar thing to eggnog that you have on Christmas in, in the U.S. We have something that is called ponche, which is basically a combination of different fruits, including peaches and um, grapes and dehydrated grains. Uh, grapes that I don't remember the name for that in English right now. Um, raisins. You mentioned, yeah. Raisins. Uh, raisins and mm -hmm. oranges and some other fruits. And you get all of them boiled on water, take out all the juice. It's really sweet. It tastes really good, but I don't want to mm -hmm. even look at the amounts of grams of carbs that you're drinking with that. A lot of uh, concentrated fructose, huh? Exactly right. Yeah. It's, it's really sweet, actually. So it makes sense. And uh, yes, you're absolutely right. The amount of gout attacks that you see on January, it's, it's amazing. Okay, so let's go to the first uh, item. Uh, number one, fructose might increase the risk of metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease, and type 2 diabetes. Uh, this comes from an article from Current Opinion of Lipidology 2013 from U.S. investigators. And in this review, 
Uh, the authors reviewed around seven, six articles that studied different aspects of the relationship between fructose intake and development of metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease, and type 2 diabetes. Now, keep in mind, this article is not a meta-analysis. Meta they reviewed different, art different articles with different methodologies, with different perspectives, different goals. Uh, main topic remains the same. And what they, what they found is High fructose, especially in sugar sweetened beverage, is a very high, it's a very important risk factor for all these diseases. Fructose increases triglycerides more than sucrose. It increases both LDL and uric acid, as was mentioned, and even low glycemic fructose decreases insulin sensitivity, increases LDL, APOB, and postprandial, meaning after you eat, triglycerides. Now, it is very likely that on this and this study what they found is a lot of high risk because of high ldl but you cannot deny also the impact that high triglycerides low hdl high uric acid will have what the the weakness of this article itself it is basically based on the theoretical component not so much on the population mm -hmm. and the the clear association well, that you will get in a controlled clinical trial of course but there is clear evidence on how high amounts of fructose will impact body weight, will impact metabolism on that side, and it will put you on a big risk. Now, we just say that with the bread. We, we think bread is bread, but even between types of bread, there are differences. And we just mentioned how sprouted grain bread might be really different from white bread. On the fructose source, it's the same thing. If you have this high fructose syrup that you have in a lot of conserv uh, on a lot of um, uh, bottle juices and stuff like that, of course that's gonna that's gonna damage you even more. And this specific art article seems to be targeting those types of fructose, not the natural one, but the one that is getting getting produced in all these products that you have on your sweet beverage aisle on the supermarket so your point is that uh, when you look at the epidemiology the the stru structural uh techniques they used to write the article those aren't incredibly strong but it's it, it wasn't meant to be that uh that kind of a study or meta-analysis anyway it's a review of the science and i i would agree i think that um the stuff they're looking at makes a lot of sense when you start looking at uh, these issues from the lens that we use. I mean, we see it all day, every day. Somebody's triglycerides start going up. That's associated with uh, loss of, of uh, appropriate carb metabolism, which is also associated with increased uh, cardiovascular inflammation indicators. It's usually associated with increasing weight. It's not a good thing. Uh, with LDL, as you pointed out, they, they, the authors of that study tend to be locked into the LDL as the actor uh, theory, whereas the more we look, the more we think it might actually not be the arsonist so much as the fire department or something, or even just a bioindicator. Either way, uh, you do tend to see that increasing elevation of LDL along with these other things happening. And for anybody that's been watching Peter Atia and any of those guys over the past year, APOB, you know, there's just that continuing uh, resounding bell about APOB, which we've been following for years. Um, anything else? On a culture remark, um, Mexico is a country that eats the most soda mm. in the world. Wow. It's, it's, it's a number one position that we don't like, but it's that's what it is. And it's impressive the amount of toddlers that you see drinking, drinking soda. Coke or Pepsi or soda or stuff like that. I mean, we're already demonetized, but th those those types of drinks, it, it it's especially on on neglected or poor communities you see uh baby bottles with i don't know i don't i don't have the name for that the thing that you get the babies to drink on 
Um, yeah, a bit. A bot. Oh, a sippy cup. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. Well, the sippy uh, cup or before that. It, 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 you, you see the baby sitting. A bottle bread. with a nipple on it. Yeah. Did you see them eating breast milk? And you see those with soda or stuff like that. It's it's yeah. it, it's amazing. And uh, if I I think our audience is is where beyond out of that point, of course. But it's also you have the toddlers or the kids on primary on elementary school or kindergarten going to the to the school with juice boxes. Yeah, and, you get that and, in the U.S. And yeah. it, it's it's like whenever I'm, I mean I'm going I'm digressing a little bit, but whenever you're starting to feed your child, the recommendation is usually start with vegetables and stuff that is not so sweet. So they they start to getting the glance of what type of eat they are eating. And if you want to, if you want them to eat meat, you can introduce that uh, a few months back, maybe after the one year and a half or two years. And the recommendation is not to start with sugar or stuff that is so sweet because they get mm -hmm. used to that and they develop this addition from the childhood. And that's what you have. Uh -huh. And then you say, why are you eating so much soda? Well, I've been eating juices since I was four. Mm. It, it's, 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 it's like no way you're addicted to sugar. Well, and I know good? even with my grandkids, um, with my grandchildren, um, their avocados were one of the first foods introduced to to all of them. I have, I have three right now, and their moms both did baby led weaning, which is pretty much a disaster. But you give them whole foods and you let them eat them on their own, and um, they would use you know avocados, and they would start there, and and a lot of you know things they could eat whole foods and not a lot of processed stuff, not a lot of baby food or anything. So I think that's, I think some of the, the new generation, the, the next generation of children, maybe will be introduced to foods differently than, you know, uh, previous generations where they've realized there's been some real deficiencies in the way kids are fed. Very good point. Looking forward to a healthier world. Jesus, to your point, uh, I remember traveling to Mexico. I used to see a thing called, is it jarritos or jarritos? Oh, yeah. Those are really popular. They're, they're, they're very inexpensive. They're, but they were, they're, they're just full with corn syrup, fructose, and other types yeah. of added sugars. Now, speaking really of high fructose corn syrup in sodas, you know, one of the things that I remember uh, a family member telling me once is, oh, she wanted a Mexican Coke because the Mexican Coke had real cane sugar in it. It, um, Coke, the, well, the Coke company, the, there's another name for them here in Mexico, but the Coke company, um, they're really secretive about what they put on their products. Mm -hmm. I don't even, I don't even think the Mexican FDA, it is called Coffee Breeze, really knows what's going on. Probably they know. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> You will see it, it on on really poor communities. You might not have a clinic, but you have a but you have a store that sells Coke. Mm. I mean, Coke goes to deeper places than even healthcare goes. Oh, for sure. So uh, it tastes different. I can tell you that. Yes, it does. Uh, it's really addictive thing to to manage, and you know the world we live in. Um, it's there's a lot of money involved, and so. It is what it is. I, I was putting my conspiracy hat for a moment. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, point number two. Let's go back to fructose. Number two, fructose and fruits specifically may or may not reduce the risk of heart disease. Now, you're saying, well, tell me what it is. Does it or doesn't? And the, I think the answer, the short answer, is yes, it does. Fruits and fruits, uh, fructose in fruits reduces heart disease, but it's not a general comment to say. It depends on what fruits. It depends on the amount. It depends on the source and the way it is prepared. So it's it's not. It, I, I'm I'm still a believer that one apple a day doesn't keep the doctor away. I I, I don't think that's the case. So in this meta analysis from 2006 from French authors. They included nine cohort studies with over, over 200,000 patients that addressed the risk of heart disease and intake of fruits and vegetables. The risk of heart disease was decreased by 4% for each additional portion per day of fruit and vegetables 
and by 7% for fruit intake only. There is a high probability of publication bias in this one, even if that is not statistically insignificant, but there is. And if you see the graphs right there, the, the graphs on your right, what you see is higher risk on the less amount of fruits that you eat. But then the risk seems to be matched the more amount of fruits that you take. So my overall conclusion of this article is it is bad if you don't eat fruits, but it's also bad if you eat too much, eat, eat too much fruit as well. I think there's there's a balance. And a comment to be said. Moderation. Perspective. But I don't know if I don't know if, if you agree with that or you have another perspective, Dr. Brewer. You know, I, I agree, Jeannie. To to me, it's like exactly what you'd expect, moderation. And it's like, why is that so difficult for people to wrap their head around? Um <clears throat> yeah, hey, Jesus, you and I know from the toxicology studies that we had to do, it's like uh, the poison is in the dose more than anything else. So high levels of stuff uh, will kill you. Even stuff that you have to have small levels of, like oxygen. Too much oxygen can kill you. Water. Too much water can kill you. And we, we understand that, but then we tend to check out our brains when we look at something in a little bit different perspective, something that we haven't studied before like fructose you know uh in our in, in our recommendations for patients what do we usually say in terms of fruits and that takes me to the next point but we do recommend some fruits but we recommend avoiding those fruits that are especially the larger the bigger fruits that are, are really rich in fructose we don't recommend apples we don't recommend mangoes we don't recommend bananas because they're just so loaded with with uh, with fructose, and I know there are antioxidants and there's fiber, but there's still a lot of fructose in it. And that leads to the third point. Fructose in blueberries might decrease the risk of type 2 diabetes. So in this article from the British Medical Journal from 2013 from the UK, they studied in a cohort of over 180,000 patients. And after adjusting for personal lifestyle dietary risk factors for diabetes, the pool has a ratio for type 2 diabetes for every three servings of a week of total whole fruit was 0.98. That means 2% 2 less risk. But see this. If you consider blueberries only, the risk decreases to 12%. Mm. For grapes and raisins, it is 11%. So on that table you see over there, you have that the biggest protective fruit, so to say, or fructose source or blueberries, and that's what we recommend, actually. Then you have grapes and raisins, then you have prunes, then you have apples and pears, bananas, grapefruit, oranges, but the, 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 you see that the jump from 12% to 2% is just really, really marked on that side. I think we lost the, the image because we lost Gilbert for a moment. Uh, he might be having a worse Wi-Fi connection than me. I hope we, have a, we can have that graph back. But that's, that's basically the recommendation. We avoid larger fruit sources. And I can tell you, myself, personally, I'm kind of uh, frustrated with watermelon because I love watermelon. I know it has a lot of water on it, but it also has a lot of fructose in it. So um, it's, I'm, Its glycemic I'm, index is 72. And I'm, mm. trying, to, I'm trying to behave on that mm. but it, it's it's it i mean it's, it's the way you're raised right i i used to eat a yeah. lot of watermelon i still like it very much but it, it getting it, being being taken out of that uh culture and that things that you used to do since child school is hard i'm glad it is watermelon and not uh soda m&ms yeah. 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 yeah 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 is that your poison Jeannie? <laughs> no not necessarily um i i I'm not really sure what mine is. Just sometimes it's just certain things. I don't have anything that's a go-to all the time for me. And you're in a safe space, safer space. It's only a couple of yeah. thousand people watch this. Oh, I'm, um, <laughs> whether I'm in a safe space or not, I, I've given myself up already. I, I am a sweets addict. I come from South Carolina, the deep Southeast of the U S and 
sweet tea was a big thing growing up blackberry cobbler you know so the blackberries are great but then you add tons and tons of table sugar then you add you make a crust out of grains to put over it and if that's not enough then you put a bunch of ice cream on top so i have struggled with sweets addiction my whole life yeah and and and, and going back to the fruits before i move to the next point if you see that the the chart so blueberries are the best thing at least according to this article. And we, 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 you, you already just to recommend that, Dr. Brewer, even before seeing this article and presenting this. If you see to the, to the far right, total fruits, yes, there is a prevention there. There's less risk of diabetes, but it's minimum 5% probably, 2 to 5%. So, uh, so Not explain the those. Th this is a whisker plot on its side, correct? Yes. So what do the whiskers mean and what do the bars mean? So you see anything that goes above the line that is the, the one, that means that they are related and can create a higher risk for type 2 diabetes. Cantaloupe? Close... Oh, that's that hurts. I love cantaloupe. Well... <laughs> <laughs> That's what the evidence says. It's not protective of diabetes and might even increase the risk. Maybe one, two percent, but it is what it is. Well, I, I'm going to I'm going to vote for maybe the reality is, you know, that that whisker bar is so far. Maybe it's actually below one, the one point zero. <laughs> so maybe it doesn't impact. Yeah, it, it, it's very <laughs> likely. <laughs> of course, if you have other stuff right there, other fructose sources, the bar is going to go way up. We're yeah. going to need more screen for that. And anything that's below one, it means that it has a positive impact on the risk for diabetes. So it's a protective factor. I'm surprised about <laughs> strawberries being so far up there. That is yep. interesting. Yeah, it is. Well, and it, the, they were saying, I think that um, when I've been reading about the glycemic index and different fruits and the higher fiber fruits, the berries are the higher fiber fruits. So that's probably why and then the you know the blueberries are high up there and then raspberries i think are pretty high too um yeah it, they're fiber. concentrated on uh if they have carbs a lot of that are not mm -hmm. net carbs so mm -hmm. that, that will have a, a lot to do and that's what we recommend blueberries blackberries raspberries and strawberries so we're not 100 percent in agreement on that strawberry that you're seeing there maybe but, just you know maybe just just not too much of strawberries probably what did they say about juices in here? Uh, in this specific article, they don't say too much about juices, but we have something about juices on the next one. But okay. I keep, it, I'm like a shill in the audience. I keep asking you questions that you're getting ready to talk about. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's just the way your, your brain is programmed on this space, Dr. Rue. You, you just know what, what's coming next. And, and I wanted to make a short comment related to this blueberry thing. I know it doesn't have to do a lot with fructose, but Today I'm inspired on the cultural references. Ha have you have you eaten uh, grasshoppers, toasted grasshoppers? You mean like real grasshoppers? Yeah, I've eaten no. ants. I I don't no. think I've eaten grasshoppers. That's that's. How about you, common. Jeannie? No, I'm out on grasshoppers and ants. So <laughs> neither one of those is a major part of the Mediterranean diet. <laughs> they are not. Not my well, Mediterranean diet. <laughs> well, the, the, the downside of those is that the way they prepare it, that, that's really common in Oaxaca, which is southern oh, yeah. Mexico. Uh, yeah. They're really good. And some of them, they gave, I, 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 I ate those on Guanajuato. Because there, there are people that bring those up from Oaxaca to Guanajuato. And the, the grasshoppers, the way they are prepared, they're basically... Um, not cooked, but more like toasted. But they mm. they add they add some salt, so they're really salty. That's the downside. And of course, you can imagine what we put in there: lemon and salsa, of hot course. Hot sauce, hot sauce, uh, <laughs> hot sauce and lemon. Yes, definitely. But they are really, really a, a really rich protein source. Hmm. So most of that is basically protein. And just thinking, thinking or talking about the smaller things that are really high on some macronutrient, just like blueberries are really high on fiber, 
uh, grasshoppers are really rich on protein, insects in general. Well, I keep thinking I've got to visit Guanajuato. It's supposed to be beautiful and uh, want to come see you. And when I do, we got to eat some grasshoppers. Definitely. There, there, we, I, I just went like two weeks ago. There's a hotel right there that is it's a castle, basically a castle. The, 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 the building was made out of that concept. They created a castle to be a hotel. It's, mm. it's, it's really good. I, I mean, we can talk further about that for whenever you're willing to come. I'm just trying to push Dr. Rear to come to Guanajuato one of these days. Well, uh, I can't yeah. help going down. Since you've got, already headed, taken us down that bunny hall, I can't help but mention the one of the weirder foods that I've eaten. Um, most of, A lot of weird foods in Japan, a lot of different types of seaweed, uh, some living kind of seaweed, even whale. Uh, I didn't know that. I regret having eaten that. And even horse, I regret having eaten that as well. But I thought the weirdest one and maybe the tastiest was a fish eyeball. Uh, they brought out the whole fish and uh, they gave me the delicacy, which was the eyeball. And, you know, they expected the crazy American to not eat it. I ate it and I thought I was surprised. It tasted really good. It was kind of salty, but we should probably go to the next slide. <laughs> I don't, we can create maybe a short topic about uh, exotic cuisine. It's going to be interesting. Mm. We're, we'll be waiting for your input on that, Jeannie. Well, I, uh, you know, I was in Italy when I was 17 and I ate fruits of Del Mar. Well, I, I was supposed to, and my dad said, why are you being squeamish? And they were purple calamari and friends and, and some sauce. And I was a pass on that for me. <laughs> Good. Octopus. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Number four, fructose can alter the appetite but the presentation matters. So in this study from the International Journal on Obesity from 2013, the authors followed a group of 15 lean subjects and 10 overweight or obese subjects to assess the impact of fruits and vegetables in both solid and beverage form in appetite. So acutely, overweight and obese patients reported a smaller reductions of hunger after consuming fruit and beverage presentations, meaning If they're eating or drinking fructose, they don't feel satisfied. That will have that probably has to do a lot more with the obesity thing mm -hmm. rather than with fruit. But they saw this phenomenon happening more with the fruit in beverage presentation. So that leads me to think also about the addictive component of the fruit that they're drinking because it, it tastes it tastes more sweet whenever you're having in a beverage form. So After the inject, yeah, go ahead. So fruit in beverage form did not decrease your appetite. It uh, increased it and was associated with obesity. Yeah, well, I, that happened on, on obese or overweight people. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it seems like it makes a lot of sense, right? After, yeah. Especially on our space with the, where we have covered how is the fat that has hormone activity and how that impacts your brain processes on society. And it just keeps it, keeps you wanting to eat, eat more, eat, eat more and eat more, eat more. Uh, after the ingestion of solid fruit, patient ingested less food in their meal. So that has to do with, with what Jeannie said. And, and I think this might apply to vegetables as well. Whenever you are starting and you start eating vegetables and some fruit, you might not eat too much of other uh, food sources. The total, the total daily energy intake was higher in the overweight and obese after beverage fruits, meaning they didn't feel satisfied, so they just keep eating mm -hmm. other stuff, especially carbs. And then hunger and fullness remained similar between groups, especially on the long term. So What uh, happens I, when, you, when they make fruit into a juice and what happens to the fiber like in an apple that would normally be there does it i mean what how is it taken out essentially when it's turned into a juice or dr burr i don't know that i know the answer to that do, do you yeah if you look at i mean you look at home uh juicing operations so you go to a bar or a grill that has one of those big orange juicers they cut the orange in half they put it on the top it squeezes the juice out, they throw out 
all of the fiber. They throw out the mm -hmm. orange peel and all of the fiber inside, and then you just mainline the juice of the fructose. Mm -hmm. So there's thinking, there's the problem there, huh? Yeah. And I will argue that even if you put that on a blender all together, first, the, depending on the peel of every food, that, that's going to take different. I don't see anybody eating the peel of a banana, right? Right. But if, on those fruits that you might, or you can keep the, the layer like apples and, and pears, um, I'm, I'm not sure the impact of that fiber is going to be the same when it's blended rather than just eating the fruit. Mm -hmm. I, I think the, the blender is still disrupting a huge component of the fiber, which is protecting the, uh, separating the fructose from the body. I mean, that's a large part of what the stomach does. And, um, when we, I would agree, I think blending is a form of processing, no question. And, uh, I, probably everybody knows this, but if there's somebody on the audience that doesn't know this, uh, whenever you see a fr um, fruit beverage that has pulp on it, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think we should believe that's really fruit pulp in it. Not very much. Um, and number five, fructose is harder than glucose on the liver. So this is another article from the British, British Medical Journal. And in mice fed with high fat diet, uh, they saw that this uh, mice developed more cases of pronounced obesity, glucose intolerance, and increased liver size. Mm -hmm. So this is this is the this is their perspective. An enzyme called ketoexokinase, the first one to metabolize fructose, was increased in fructose fed mice and they can see that there's evidence that that happens on obese humans that has fatty liver disease as well. So if you have fatty liver disease, you're very likely going to have more issues on metabolizing fructose that your overall health is subject. Fructose uh, decreases fatty acid production, but also decreases insulin signaling in the liver the opposite to the effect of other types of glucose. So on the other glucose, they can produce fatty acid instead of decreasing it. And they said that in the liver, glucose might increase insulin signaling. But I don't think that's a really positive effect or really impactful. I think the, the major component here is even though fructose might decrease fatty acids in some form on the liver, it impacts insulin sensitivity. And it's, it might be related to fatty liver disease as well. The graph is showing the weight of the liver on the mice, on, the, on mice. And the more fructose, the more size um, on the liver. So that's one of the things that I've heard. Either one of you familiar with Robert Lustig? I think, yeah, I think you have covered uh, uh, some of his research in the past, yes. Yeah, he's a big, um, he, 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 there's a, some similarities between him and a, another fellow named David Ludwig. Number one, their names sort of sound the same. Number two, they're both uh, endocrinologists. Number three, they both run um, obesity units in academic centers. Robert Lustig over in, uh, what, what is it? UC San Francisco, I think. And uh, David Ludwig at one of the Harvard related institutions, maybe Brigham and, Women, and Women's. Um, and both of them have written books about uh, carbs and the problems associated with carbs and insulin resistance, diabetes, prediabetes. David Ludwig's book is um, Always Hungry because his was referring to that thing of where, you know, when you start getting insulin resistant, you, your blood sugars start doing this. And it's like, so you, you get hungry, you eat something that's got carbs in it, your blood sugar goes up, then it comes back down and you get hungry again as it comes back down. So his book is a good one. It gives you some perspectives on how to totally clean out your kitchen and reconfigure it for low carb eating. Robert Lustig really focuses a lot. I think one of his books was called titled something like 
pure white and deadly. And I believe he was talking about table sugar in that one. He spends a lot of time talking about fructose and how fructose is even uh, <clears throat> in his uh, perspective, even more dangerous than, uh, than sugar. Uh, he tells a story in one of his books early on about, I think it was like a six year old child and the child was on, the family was on food stamps. The child was morbidly obese. And what he found out was the mother was giving the child, she could get orange juice all she wanted on her food stamps. And the child was drinking like two gallons of orange juice a day. So talk about major overdose on uh, concentrated fructose. Bad news. Okay. Any, anyhow, I couldn't help but uh, bring the, uh, think about that as I'm listening to your to the articles today on fructose. All right, so that's what we have for the show today. I'm 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 kind of skimming on the comment section. There are really good questions. Uh, remember to address some of the YouTube members, Dr. Brewer. I know that's my job. I won't be able to stay for the Q and A section. We have a lot of patients today, so I have a lot of stuff to prepare before that. So uh, I'll leave you with Jeannie to deal with the Q&A section. Really interesting questions. You can text me if you have. Uh, I saw a question about the grasshoppers and stuff like that. I would love to address that uh, maybe in the future. But Well, do you want to hit, it, hit the grasshopper question before you leave? Uh, well, maybe we can do that. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't see it here. But somebody said that they're they're linked to gliomas, which are a type of a tumor on the brain. What I will say is, I don't know if there's some source of confusion, because there is there's one thing that is called grasshopper algorithm, which is something that is used to study gliomas, but it doesn't have anything to do with eating grasshoppers. It's just the mm -hmm. name that they they made they they give to that process of investigating gliomas. So I don't know if that there's a confusion over there in some source. Uh, but I will. I'm definitely going to research more about the risk of eating grasshoppers. My ex expectation is that um, you don't want to eat too much of those, of course. But I don't think it's going to happen anything to you if you eat a couple of them once you come to Guanajuato, and that's it. I remember as a kid, I had a grasshopper milkshake once, and it wasn't really grasshopper. They named it that because it was a mint milkshake, and I don't think it was very good for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right so uh, i'll leave you then uh thank you so much everybody and stay for the q a thank you jesus so uh we've got a new member jan williamson thank you so much uh jan for becoming a youtube member when you become a member like that, you help us get this uh, life-saving information out to the rest of the world. So with a small contribution from you, which comes from that membership, uh, we're able to, uh, to have the, the right team, a skilled group of people which help us create this information. Gilbert, for example, is a graphics guy, very talented, and he also helps us run the channel. He's making sure, for example, he saw us talk about... Um, joining as a membership and he plopped that banner up at the top so you could see how to do it. Now, Jeannie, as uh, Jesus and I were talking about, he's, uh, he, he tries to, uh, to ride herd on me and discipline me to make sure that I, that I cover the members' comments and questions first. And you see that little uh, design right there? That says that Greg Scaife is a member. So Greg says, good morning. Another interesting topic today. Uh-oh, JMK is not a member, but JMK has provided us a lot of, uh, of contributions. A lot of, in fact, if you'll show uh, Gilbert how to do a, uh, um, a super chat, JMK has done several of those. Super, super chat right there. It's the bottom of the chat and mm -hmm. you can click on that item. So JMK is saying if S small dense LDL, 24 nanometers is, and fully large LDL are essentially the same size, 
how come only SD small dense LDLs are the majority of the LDL particles that end up in the coronary sub endothelial space during coronary artery disease? I don't think we know enough about that product, JMK, but it's a very interesting question. There's a couple of things that we do know. One is we used to think that um, we've always known that plaque, uh, the, the small dense LDL particles could make it through the endothelial layer, but they could not make it through the um, uh, the media, the muscular layer, they would get stopped in between the two. And that's why we look at a CIMT. The IMT stands for intimate media thickness. It's that layer in between the two. Um, another thing that some uh, researchers from UT, University of Texas, discovered recently, we used to think it was a hole in the intima that allowed um, that small dense LDL to go through. But that's not so, uh, that's not correct. What they discovered is a thing called transcytosis, which if you know the root words, it's exactly what it sounds like. The, these uh, particles, the small dense LDL particles are actually going through the injured uh, intima cell, but they're stopping again at the media layer. Now, your point is, why is that not happening with the large? You know, you hear a ton of theories. The large are like beach balls and the smaller like pellets. You're bringing up a good point, which raises the question and points out the fact that we don't really know why. But for some reason, it does appear to be the small, dense LDL. Any comments, um, Jeannie? No, I, I mean, I would think uh, I was just thinking about that and, um, you know, the large fluffy with the, the beach ball and it may be more difficult for it to travel through the layers where the, like you said, the the ones that are more condensed and they have enough force to get through. Maybe that's why. So we had, a, you and I discussed this question before we started. James came on early and asked a good question. Is fructose from prunes safe to eat? for a type two diabetic. Uh, by the way, hemoglobin, what, what is that? HB1A1 is, Hemo oh, hemoglobin, hemoglobin A1C A1 is 5.6. Congratulations for, James has shared with us before that he is full-blown diabetic. Um, any comments about prunes and diabetes? Well, um, I think the uh, fiber in prunes is pretty high. So it probably the, um, I mean, it was, I think it was on one of the graphs or it was somewhere I looked up. So I would think it was because of the fiber and probably I, it would be the reaction to that person eating the prunes and um, their blood sugar. And if the glycemic index and the fiber are, you know, work together, then it, I think it probably would be okay to try. What would you say? What would you say? I would agree. And, and I think both of us made the, I think you made the point first. It's a heck of a lot safer than prune juice. Yep. As uh, Fort Worth Westside mentioned, today's topic is near and dear to Dr. Robert Ludstig's heart. He talks about it quite a bit. Now, Melissa, who is a member, says she has avocado toast every morning with, with Ezekiel bread as well. You know, I started it's. As Jeannie mentioned that I, I've got a friend who's a, um, who is a vegan. And as I've mentioned before, I tend not to argue too much and get into the debate of, is it vegan? Should it be paleo? Should it be um, carnivore? I've got plenty of carnivore patients. I've got someone on the staff who actually tends to uh, go vegan. My concern is not the source of, uh, macronutrients. My concern is less even about the macronutrients, even though we talk about those a lot. My concern is knowing whether or not you can tolerate uh, all the macronutrients. And so many of us, especially as we age, cannot metabolize carbs very well. As we get into insulin resistance, it becomes more of a poison to us as especially as we start mainlining it. And that is the way uh, many of our processed foods are set up. So you, you take apples, you squeeze them, you, 
you get apple juice, mm, you're mainlining carbs. Uh, orange juice, same thing. I had I had a patient. He's a he's a good friend and patient now. <clears throat> I was telling his story to a couple of people yesterday. He came to see me. He'd already had two events. He was expecting to have his third event, event meaning heart attack. And he was expecting to not live much longer. Uh, as we began to talk, he, uh, we looked through his labs and sure enough, his blood sugar uh, on challenge was at 300. That's not a good thing. And, no wonder he had already had two heart attacks. And guess what he had for breakfast? Apple juice. <laughs> two, uh, two large glasses of orange juice with two large bowls of cereal. And he couldn't, he can't, he kept saying, yeah, that's yeah, orange juice is healthy. And, and so this is good cereal. It's a, it's a healthy cereal too. And it's like, Oh my gosh, your, your blood sugar goes up to 300 and the, your breakfast every morning gives you a lot more sugar than you got with this glucose test. So your blood sugar's cranking up to 300 or more every morning to start the day. And instead of coming back down in an hour or two, it's just staying up there until you eat something else. So after arguing with me, you know, I thought I walked away from that event uh, uh, evaluation thinking, hmm, this guy's not getting it. Going to be a problem. Sure enough, he listened. He turned around. He stopped. Uh, he really dropped his carbs. And without trying, he lost 40 pounds over the next six months. Just he, he, people kept saying, dang, he looks good. Have you seen Mark? He looks great. And so what are we six years later and he's not had an event and he's feeling wonderful. Well, and I think that that's something um, that, that people really, I think the, the glucose monitor, the continuous glucose monitor is the one of the best tools that we can offer anyone. And I myself have been wearing one and, and am shocked at times with the results with when you add hit um, exercise with it, what it does to that. And, um, I think if people would have been given that early on in their lives, they would learn, have learned a lot about their body. You know, they try to give these carte blanche responses to this diet, this diet, this diet. Well, those never work for everybody. So everyone's specific and everyone's an individual, everyone's body works differently. So why not give everyone a glucose monitor so they can learn that? It would make sense, wouldn't it? Oh, you know, that's what one of my, have I already complained about the FDA today? Uh, I think um, I did uh, a little bit, oh, yeah, but you can go more. <laughs> <laughs> the, I don't think I to, uh, they're a great organization. They, you know, they got an impossible job. I would do it very differently. A lot of stuff very differently. One of them is I would never have, have restricted Libre or the other continuous glucose monitors by saying you have to have a prescription. So I've advertised that for years, ever since it came out that we'll be more than happy to, uh, to write a script for you to get uh, continuous glucose monitoring. Because, you know, can you imagine going 60 years and not knowing what the food that you eat does to your blood sugar? Not even well, and, and, I mean, think about that, though. 98% of people are probably, I'm not, that's a guesstimate, but the majority of people still don't know what it does to their blood sugar. And they you know, it, it's very inexpensive in the big scheme of things. You know, it's essentially a couple dollars a day, but people spend so much money on food and diets and pills and supplements and all this stuff. And if they would just look at their blood sugar and what they're eating and what it does to that, and, and, you know, it just, it would make so much sense. It would, it would be so wise, but I've got a couple of friends that actually three friends right now that uh, have gotten interested in a CGM. The third one has not tested it yet. This first one is in her thirties and she had said, I don't remember why she said she had some questions about her glucose metabolism, but sure enough, in about three days after starting her Libre she sent me a text saying, yep, I had a rice dish. I forgot what they called it. It's a, a 
a, a Pacific Asian rice dish. And she said, and my blood sugar went up to like 260. And it's like, oh, well, you know, although that's not good, it's a heck of a lot better than that happening every time you eat that rice dish and you not knowing. Right, right. The, yeah. second, the second of these three uh, ladies that have recently started that I know on, um, the second one just put it on and sure enough, her blood sugar was 150, 155. So she's, uh, she's more uh, my age. Uh, she's not young like you. She's uh, 60. I'm 53. I'm not oh, that there young. There you go. <laughs> so uh, it's a surprise. It's much, much better to know than not. Because you know what? You can take every bit of that risk off the table. You can keep your the lining of your arteries very, very clean and healthy. And that is the goal. So Melissa, uh, again, the, the member that's made a few comments about Ezekiel bread said she loves it. It's very tasty. Cannot stand the taste of other breads after eating Ezekiel bread. So yes, it's just been over the past few years that uh, a lot of these breads that are keto friendly, low carb friendly, have started making the, uh, making the, uh, the becoming available. There's some breads, some of the keto breads are made with uh, other than uh, with uh, flours, other than um, with Why, low carb like flour, flour. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, like arrowroot flour, or uh, I think it was arrowroot, and the other one I think was uh, almond flour, almond, but, almond and coconut. They uh, yeah, they have a lot of different flours. Yeah, and then there was uh, as we're talking about today. Then there's the sp sprouted breads. Mm -hmm. So, oh, wait a minute. Black Tengu, also a member. When I was originally prescribed Lipitor before switching to Crestor, well, that was a good switch. I was also prescribed five milligrams of folic acid for carotid artery disease. Why? Recently stopped it because I read it affects the immune system. I don't know why. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure. We don't use that. Any comments? I don't, I don't know either on that one. Ricky the Gun, also a member, had a physical with my local Baildenine uh, method doctor, suggested I have cardiac stress test, MRI test as a part of my prevention testing. Isn't CME, CIMT a better test? You know, Ricky the Gun, it's, um, as you may know, I did a lot of work with the Baildenine crowd uh, a few years ago. And in fact, I uh, owe a lot to Brad and Amy. They taught me a lot. Um, one of the problems with the Baildenine uh, method doctors is that they, uh, they don't all really know how to practice Baildenine. Uh, and that's one of the biggest issues. What happens is the doctor will go to a weekend seminar, sometimes even a one day seminar, and they quote, become a Baildenine doctor. Well, they go back, you know, they, they get interested, they get excited. And uh, Brad and Amy talk a lot about this uh, dive, similar to us, they focus a lot more on diabetes and even dental disease as being associated with heart disease as opposed to LDL. Um, sometimes they focus a little bit more on dental disease and miss the point that, well, I'm going down a bunny hole. I'm going to back off on that and say, uh, be careful about the quality of your baldenine doc. That's all. It's you know, there's um, you have it. There's a fairly low bar for uh, getting in and staying in the baldenine uh, community, and um, I'd love to see them uh, increase the rigor of the uh, the folks that wear that moniker. Any uh, other comments? No. I, I would agree with you. If you haven't had a CIMT, Ricky the Gun, that's we clearly go to CIMT. We rarely, I think I've done one stress test over the past 10 years. Um, and it was because of a special situation with that patient. The patient actually wanted it, not me. Um, and yes, we use a lot of CIMT. So I'm leaning exactly where you're leaning, Ricky the Gun. Let's see here. We had a whole bunch. Okay, here's another. Um, 
Black Tengu. Question of calcium scoring. Would like to do a calcium score, but scared since I have a lifetime radiation dose of 50 millisieverts. I've been hit with 36 millisieverts and a cardiac CT, yeah, with a negative result. That's frustrating, Black Tengu. So what happens is we get these uh, um, radionucleotide um, uh, stress tests all the time, and those things have a lot of um, radiation. Then when you go to the cath lab and you're uh, they're placing stents or doing um, um, pic taking pictures, they're injecting uh, dye and, again, huge doses of radiation. Now, here's the thing. The amount of radiation in a CT, I mean, in a, well, the calcium score is a CT uh, technology. It is basically CT where they've taken the computers and figured out how to hit the timing. So the movement of the arteries in the, uh, the coronary arteries as the heart beats is synchronized. So they can actually measure the calcium. The, um, the radiation from those is minimal. It is very minimal, especially as compared to the risk of what we're talking about. So I don't really consider a calcium score as a significant risk. Now you would say, I've already had 36 millisieverts. I, I understand. I think the difference between 30, going from 36 to 37 is uh, minimal compared to having the correct information about your risk for heart attack and stroke. We'd be happy to talk to you. One of the questions I would have would be, uh, what about CIMT? Because CIMT is an ultrasound technology and it has no millisieverts, zero. So it's not an ionizing radiation. Any comments about that? No, I would be curious what the negative result was on that. Uh, what the negative, oh, on the, yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. yeah, a good point. Mm -hmm. Why did we go to all of that uh, radiation and then get a negative result? And then why would you justify doing that? I, I did, um, that, I do cover that in detail, Black Tengu, on, on my book. We're talking about why a stress test can't predict your heart attack. And we go into a lot of detail on this radiation issue. We also go into a lot of detail on uh, part of what Jeannie, I think, might be bringing up is why you would do that. Unfortunately, I've I haven't said that very much in the past, but as I get deeper and deeper into this, um, I guess I'm getting old and crotchety and calling it like it is. One of the big issues here is uh, the financial, the revenue systems for large hospital systems, cardiac hospitals, for large clinics, for uh, doctors, tends to get wrapped up in doing these high tech procedures, which are often associated with a lot of radiation. Yeah. I've, seen, I've had multiple patients come to me. I've had uh, patients 30 years old come to me who'd been having a radiation stress test every year for the past 10 years. And it was because he had some symptoms playing basketball in one of those New York, uh, you know, you ride down the street in New York and you see some of these uh, open parks. He was from that area. He had a couple of symptoms uh, in, at age 20. Kaboom, he got hooked into that system and the doc was doing a um, radiation-based stress test, thallium stress test every year. Yeah. Bad. Yeah. Not good. Okay. Melissa, the member, can you get the first phase back if you learn? Yes, you can. Um, you can get a lot of this function back. People talk about it routinely about getting, quote, getting your pancreatic function back. What, what do we see? I think you really can't tell the difference between uh, getting that pancreatic function back and just getting your carb metabolism function back. We see that most often with people that have 10 pounds of body fat to lose. It's body fat that drives this problem. There are three major issues. One is genetics. One is body fat. And the third one is age. Well, when you think about it, you can't change your age. 
You can't change your genetics, but you can change your body fat. Uh, and that's why people like, um, oh, I'm, uh, is it Jason Fung talk about, quote, curing diabetes. You're not really curing your propensity to insulin resistance, but you are taking the risk associated with diabetes right off the table if, you t if you're losing that body fat. Any comments? I was just thinking about the, um, you know, how the, the cells of Langerhang, the islet cells of Langerhang produce mm -hmm. um, the insulin. And, you know, the theory I know back in the 90s was that no one really knew why they, they quit. You know, when people were type 2 diabetic, it was like, why did they stop producing? Did they get worn out? Was someone eating too much sugar? I mean, I, I was just thinking along this line, are those cells, are they able to... Um, reproduce if they're damaged or if they're worn out? Can, can your body make more of those in the pancreas? Yeah, it's a good question. And I don't think we know the answer. What we do know, though, is that people can uh, regain uh, in certain situations, people can regain uh, proper insulin function. And the, the situation that I see over and over and over again is, you know, it's just like one of the patients we had yesterday. Uh, came in, he had plaque. It, and it's like one of the classic things that we see that I didn't used to see before the channel. First time I saw it, it confused me. Somebody coming in with plaque, yet we did the OGTT and it was completely normal. And then you began to ask a few more questions and they say, well, like this fellow yesterday. Yeah, about two years ago, I weighed 80 pounds more than I do now. Yeah. Now, I was on that call with you, wasn't I? <laughs> uh, I think you might have been. Yeah. 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 So Elizabeth Pan, another member, said, is there such a thing as sprouted rice? That's a really good question. We've got a lot of folks that um, rice is a critical part of their diet, a core part of their diet. And um, there is that would be a big deal. There is. There is. It says organic sprouted uh, brown rice organic sprouted short grain rice. And it looks like, I don't know if that's something only you can buy online. I don't know that much about them. Some of them have five stars. So there are sprouted rice products. Very, very interesting. I've never heard it of says, that. Sprouted brown rice has four times the GABA content of regular brown rice and over 10 times the GABA of white rice. Research shows that after germination, brown rice is higher in several antioxidants, vitamin E, protein, healthy fats, and fiber. It's also has a lower glycemic index, so it's better for your blood sugar. Good question, Elizabeth Pan. There you go. <clears throat> Aura Ruth is, uh, is from the Middle East, and she was clarifying. Correcting me, because I said <laughs> sunflower <laughs> seeds before I corrected myself. I knew it was coming. <laughs> Thank you, Aura Ruth. <laughs> Okay, so let me ask you, if, when you've looked through, have you seen other questions that we need to make sure we cover? I'm going to need I, to uh, leave soon. We've got patients. I've got patients in a few minutes. Me too. Uh, have you I, can't, I don't see any through? others myself because I can't see any. Oh, man, you're getting you're getting hammered on that comment. You know what? You have I to knew be careful was... what you say here. If you say something you wrong, we've got a smart group. You can't and... say mentholated, can you? <laughs> <laughs> we were in a we were in a patient meeting the other day, and and uh, instead of methylated B vitamin uh, complex, Gina, uh, G Jenny, Jenny mentioned uh, mentholated, and oh mentholated. my goodness, did she catch it? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so. Timothy Bliskey, five foot seven, 167 pounds. I cut out a lot of sugar and substitutes. I believe the fiber may serve some counter purpose to the standard sugar carbs. So I eat high fiber, whole food diet. Uh, well, you know, it, it brings up, that brings up a comment that Jeannie made a couple of times early on about the sequence of uh, dieting or the sequence of eating something. And it's, it's a well-known thing. If you, if you add fiber, if you add fat, 
to a high carb meal, you slow down the body's uh, ability to metabolize it and therefore slow down the glycemic index. One of the things we'll do for someone who comes in that has insulin resistance, who loves oatmeal, we won't debate. I mean, we'll let them know that you should check the impact on your blood sugar. But here's the other thing. If you really have to have that oatmeal for breakfast and it's, and it's peaking your blood sugar, try putting a little peanut butter or better yet, almond butter in there with it. That fat will slow, the, slow down the glycemic index. There's sprouted oatmeal. Uh, sprouted oatmeal. I can't believe it. I, I, we have discovered a new deal. It's not new. With it's everything. We didn't, we didn't know. No. Nope. And now we do. So if you don't have anything else, I'm going to have to go uh, get us ready to start seeing some patients today. I will do the same. And I will try not to get nervous and say the wrong words because I will get corrected. So <laughs> I'll be on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. It was a fun show today. Hey, have a good day. Bye-bye.